filled with the best food. Can you hear the Father calling? There's a tea just for you. And at this table, all is forgiven. Trade in your chains of bondage for crowns of freedom. All are welcome at the table. There is a place just for you. No condemnation at the table. There is a place just for you. Just for you. This is the tape of new beginnings. These cups are full of love, and it's never in. And at this table, there are no Just a loving father and his sons and daughters welcome at the table. There is a place just for you. No condemnation at the table. There is a place just for you. All are welcome. There is a place just for you. No condemnation at the table. There is a place just for you. There is a place just for you. Good evening. Welcome to our Good Friday service. Tonight is a unique opportunity for us to pause and to sit in the weight of the crucifixion. So often we rush into the joy of the resurrection without pausing first to sit in the weight of the cross. So tonight we're going to do just that. We're going to sit in the weight of the cross. You know, the, the cross is this paradoxical symbol. It's this place of pain, but also a place of peace. It, it's a symbol of suffering, but also one of victory. And we're going to be looking at that paradox together with our time this evening. We're also going to be using this image of a table as we go on a journey together during this service. We're going to begin with Jesus and his disciples in the upper room where they shared the Last Supper. We're going to move from there to the cross, and then we're going to return again to the table as we remember the hope that we have in Christ. During our service, Christine here is going to be painting a live painting for us that really brings together these themes of pain and suffering. You know, beauty and art are one of, the, one of the ways that we get to connect with the Lord. So I would encourage you throughout the service to watch as this painting develops and, and uh, use that as an opportunity to help, help you connect with the Lord. During our time together this evening, we are going to uh, be sitting some. We're going to be standing some. We're going to invite you to come forward at times. But as we get started, I just want to invite you to sit here for a moment to welcome the Spirit and to prepare your heart as we continue to worship and encounter the paradox of the cross this evening. Okay. 
shared with it Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling to sing along with me. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ. To leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling you up So bring your sorrows and treat them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling, oh come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, forgiveness was bought with the precious blood.
as a family we say together, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. All over the room. Every hour I need. Said my one, my one. I'll never forget the way the table looked when I walked into the room. It was one of the first times that we had had a group of friends over after the pandemic, and we had invited some friends over to celebrate my birthday. And Lindsay had said that she was going to you know, make a, a little bit of food for people, a few snacks. But I walked into the room, and the table was just covered in the most amazing charcuterie spread you've ever seen curated cheese and cured meats, crackers and chips and dips and olives and pickled vegetables and everything that you could want. Empty wine glasses ready to be filled for an evening of celebration together. As people came and gathered and we sat down at that table, we, we just sat and we did not stand up for the next three hours, just enjoying time together around the table. A table is something that brings people together. It draws people in. It's invitational. It invites people into community. And as we look at the life and ministry of Jesus, we see that Jesus spends a lot of time around the table with people. Whether we think of the first meal that Jesus uh, shares with Matthew after he calls him to be his disciple, or the dinner party that Jesus participates in at Simon the Pharisee's house, or even that picnic out in the wilderness that Jesus shared with 5,000 of his closest friends when he multiplied the bread and the fish, Jesus spends a lot of time around the table with people. And all of these stories that we have of Jesus around the table are stories of invitation, stories of community, stories of hospitality. But this table was different. As Jesus gathered around a table in the upper room on the Thursday after he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, this table was different. Jesus and his disciples were there to celebrate the Passover. And the Passover was a, was a big feast, right? Think uh, Christmas feast with your family or Thanksgiving feast with friends. This was like celebration. This was joy. But tonight, it was a little bit different. The tone was a little bit different because at one point in the meal, we hear Jesus say some startling, some jarring words. This is what he says in Matthew 26, verse 20. When it was evening, he reclined at table with the 12. And as they were eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Now, I'm not sure how familiar you are, you are with dinner party etiquette, but uh, this is kind of a buzzkill, right? You start a celebratory meal, and Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. We think about this comment that we make, that, that Jesus makes, and, and it, everybody is surprised, 
right? Jesus, what are you talking about? Everybody is wondering what he means. Everyone is taken off guard, except of course for Judas. Because Judas already had 30 pieces of silver jingling around in his pocket when he agreed to betray his friend to his enemies. Jesus calls it out. One of you tonight is going to betray me. We see how the disciples respond in the next verse, verse 22. They were sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? They begin to go around the table asking, Jesus, could, could this be me? Asking themselves, could this be me who is going to betray my Lord? And th this question strikes me as a bit odd. It strikes me as odd because these are people who have been walking with Jesus for three years. Uh, they had been through a lot with Jesus up to this point. You would think that at this time, they would know if they were going to be the one who was going to betray Jesus. And yet they ask themselves this question and they ask Jesus this question, is it I, Lord? And I think the reason they do this is because they recognized when they looked inside of themselves that each of them was capable of betraying Jesus. You know, it takes an incredible amount of courage and self-awareness to look into the cauldron of our own soul and come to terms with some of the dark things that we are capable of thinking, saying, or doing. And I'm not just talking about big things like murder and adultery, even though we see the seeds of those things in our hearts as we become angry or as we have lustful thoughts, but even the smaller things, telling a little white lie to protect our reputation or choosing to ignore that poor person out of guilt at our own overconsumption. And when we look into our own hearts and we hear the statement of Jesus, one of you will betray me, we need to ask that question, is it I, Lord? Lord, what are the ways that I might be tempted to betray you? Because if we are honest with ourselves, there's a little bit of Judas in all of us. The Bible calls this sin, the ways in which we go wrong the ways in which we live outside the loving rule and reign of Jesus. And when we come face to face with that own, our own sin that sits in the cauldron of our souls and oftentimes works its way out onto the exterior, as we come to terms with that, sometimes our response might be one of shame, one of guilt, one of fear. And, and we want to shove it back down. We want to hide it. We want to cover it. We don't want anyone to see it. We don't really want to think about it. But at this table, this is a table of invitation. It's a table to come and take that which we would rather push back down into the darkness and instead bring it into the light. We call this the practice of confession of naming that which is in our own soul, those things that we have done that we ought not to have done, those things that we have left undone that we ought to have done. When we name them, we're honest with ourselves and with God and we confess. And the beauty of the table is that we know that when we come forward in honesty before the Lord, we are met with forgiveness. We know that because of what Jesus says next. If we uh, go down a few verses to verse 26, we read this. Now when they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, drink, drink it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins we can have confidence that when we come to God confessing all that is dark inside of us, all of the ways that we have gone wrong on the inside and the outside, we are met with the forgiveness that Jesus purchased for us on the cross. And so I want to invite us into the practice of confession together this evening. 
In the back of the seats in front of you, there's a small rock and a pen. If you're in the front row, it's under your seats. And I would want to invite you to take that out and to take a moment to think about a word or a phrase that encapsulates some kind of confession that you would have. An opportunity to take something from the darkness and to bring it to the light in the presence of the Lord. We're going to give you about a minute to, to think and to sit with that. And then when you're ready, I want to invite you to come up. And we have two buckets up here. And to take that sin that you want to confess and to drop it in that bucket. And then you can make your way back to your seat. So take a moment to reflect, write down your word or phrase. And then when you're ready, come forward and lay your confession in the bucket.
my debt is paid, it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the sun sets free, oh, is free. Less than 24 hours after Jesus sat around this table with his disciples, we find him hanging on a cross. It's amazing how fast the shift comes from this meal that was meant to be celebration to this talk of betrayal to the crucified king actually hanging there. And as we think about that, as we think about Jesus on the cross, we have to think about what Jesus experienced while he was there. Matthew tells us what those final moments of Jesus' life were like before he breathed his last. Matthew 27, verse 45. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over the land until the ninth hour. And at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As Jesus hung on the cross, he felt so alone. His disciples had scattered, they had abandoned him. The people that were left there at the cross were either there to actually nail him to it or to make fun of him and mock him as he hung there. And more than that, he felt abandoned by his father in heaven. The agony that Jesus experienced on the cross is hard to put into words. But it wasn't only the physical pain that Jesus experienced. It wasn't only the emotional pain of being abandoned and humiliated. We also know that as Jesus hung on that cross, that the weight of our sins were placed on his shoulders. And that as Jesus hung on that cross, the wrath of God, which was meant for us, was poured out on his son. We think about what Jesus did on the cross for us. What he took on himself so that we might have life the weight of the sins of the world on his shoulders. And yet, as Jesus hung there, and as we sit under the weight of that even tonight and think about all that he experienced out of love for us, there's also an element of hope here. There's an element of hope, yes, that our sins are forgiven and that we have life, absolutely. But there's another element of hope that we can draw from this 
because that we know that as Jesus suffered on the cross, as he experienced pain, that he knows what it's like when we are in pain. He knows what it's like to be human. He knows what it's like to be hungry and thirsty. He knows what it's like to be mocked, to be beaten. He knows what it's like to be mistreated and abandoned. Jesus knows what it's like to be us because he became one of us so that he could die for us, so that he could be with us forever. So the cross is by nature the symbol of pain, an instrument that was designed to inflict the most amount of physical and emotional pain possible. And yet, at the same time, the cross is not a place of defeat, but a place of victory. It's not a place that we just look at and always feel that weight, but it's a place that we can look and find companionship with our Savior who suffered for us and who also suffers with us. It reminds us that Jesus understands our pain, that he entered into pain for us. And so if you are here tonight and you are in pain, or whatever place in your life you encounter pain, know that your Savior is there with you, loving you right in that place, in the midst of your pain, while he works to heal that very pain. As we get ready to sing again, I invite you to just take a moment to think about the pain that you are experiencing and just feel the presence of your loving Savior with you in the midst of that. Church, I want to invite you to stand for these next couple songs. So we pray. 
started this evening thinking about that meal that Jesus shared with his disciples, about the betrayal of, Ju of Judas and the own, uh, the own ways that we have betrayed Jesus as well. We moved to the cross and we thought about how our Savior died for our sins so that we might be forgiven and have life and that he can also relate to our pain and suffering because he has experienced it as well. I want to bring us back to the table now. But I want you to imagine a different table. Not the table that Jesus sat at with his disciples for the Last Supper, but a table that we read about in Psalm 23. Psalm 23, verse 5, we read this. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. The imagery of this verse always strikes me. It's beautiful and it's paradoxical language, just like we've seen with the cross. It's a table prepared for us in the presence of our enemies. The image to me that, that comes to mind is being out in this forest and there's this clearing in the middle and there's this table that's set up that is just immaculate. I mean, a feast that is prepared out here in the forest and the, the light is coming down through the treetops and just lighting up the table with this warm glow. It's invitational, it's hospitable, it's a feast, it's abundance. And then as we look out from the table at the trees are surrounding us in the shadows of the trees, we see the wolves lurking, beady eyes peering out at us. And we wonder, is this an image that's mo supposed to make me feel safe? Or is this an image that is supposed to make me feel afraid? Could it be a little bit of both? The image of God, our shepherd, who prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies is very much like the cross, this symbol of 
both suffering and danger and yet hope and victory and abundance as well. And this is how we experience life this side of eternity. That as we go through life, we will always have encounters with our enemies. There will be hardships, there will be trials that lurk out in the trees that sometimes even make their way right into our heart and it feels like they're sitting at the table with us. And yet we know that this is a table that has been prepared for us by our loving Father who provides for us, who protects us, and who is with us right in the midst of whatever we may experience. This painting captures this so well, right? We have the cross, which is this symbol of pain, an instrument that was used to crucify people. And yet this image has been transformed and the light bursts through from the background, reminding us that the cross is not just a symbol of pain and agony and suffering, but the cross is a symbol of hope. The cross is a symbol of life. It's a table for us in the presence of our enemies. It's a little bit paradoxical. It's a little bit ominous. And we know that as we walk through this life, one thing that we can be sure of is that we will have encounters with our enemies. We will experience hardship. We will experience suffering. We will experience some of what Jesus experienced while he was a man. And yet the story doesn't end there for us because we know that God has prepared a table, that he invites us in, that he has promised protection and provision and abundance. That in the midst of our suffering, because of the work of Jesus, we also have reason for great hope, for great peace, for unspeakable joy. I want to invite up Jenny O'Malley now. Jenny is going to come and she's going to share with us some of her story of how she has experienced hope in the midst of suffering. Jenny, come on up. I was diagnosed with cancer about two and a half years ago. And before I was able to make a full recovery, I went through more tests and more biopsies and found another cancer six months later. I'm not a person who normally checks for these cancers, yet I found the breast cancer myself. And the lung cancer was because it was hurting right here one day and it led to some scans and then they found the lung cancer as a result of that. Overall, this experience, I was grateful. I was diagnosed with two unrelated cancers within six months. So I could say, why is this so unfair? Why are the odds against me? How does you know, this even happen? But God gave me this perspective. I live in a place with the best doctors and surgeons around. I live at a time where there's tests and scans that could find these cancers and also treatment. I also have great insurance, which ensured that I was able to get the great treatment. So I would say, I would, I'm at the top 0.1, no, 0.01% of the population, because how many people could get that? So actually, I feel grateful and I feel blessed. One of the things, as I was going through all the diagnosis, and finding out one cancer after another, um, people would ask me, how are you doing? Are you okay? What can I do to help you? Physically, I have to say, I was just fine because I felt the same way as I did the day before I was diagnosed with cancer. But emotionally, it's a toll. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a ton of tests. I kept going to the hospital. Um, and each tests and each scan unearth more questionable things that led to more tests, more scans, more biopsies. I literally spent a month and a half going in and out procedures pretty much all the time. And at this time, I thought, I don't want to put my life on hold. I don't need to know my diagnosis in order to live. I am live right now. I want to live and savor each moment 
that God has blessed me with. I want to appreciate and enjoy each and every day. And this would have been impossible had my mind and heart gone down through a path of fear, worry, and anxiety. So I held on to this verse that God gave me. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. Did I say Thanksgiving? I'm, you, <laughs> okay, if I didn't, it's with uh, prayer and supplication and Thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So during this time, I told God my thoughts, I made my requests, and I tried to remain thankful, finding things to be thankful about, just like the, the, the good doctors and things like that. And I just let God do his own thing, which is giving me peace, a peace that's beyond human understanding, that surpasses that understanding to guard my heart and mind. And... I also asked for a lot of prayer from my fellow believers, brothers and sisters, that God would guard my heart, especially in the evening hours when I'm tired and my mind tend to wander and sort of go down a negative path to just keep me focused on him. So I could say that during this time, I was able to go on some nice hikes with my friend and enjoy the flowers that bloom. I, I think I've it's strange. During that period of time, I think I felt more alive than ever. I was so focused on everything that was alive. I cannot say that I never feared or worried, but I can say that those moments were few. And I was on the majority of the time able to focus on living. But I have to back up a little bit. There is one point in time the doctor told me that I might have stage four. This is during all the tests of all the various things that was possible. And so I went through a very scary one week of uh, waiting for the biopsy, getting it done, and then uh, finding out the results. It turned out to not be it. But I have to say that during this stressful week, I was still emotionally at peace. Though I didn't know if I was going to live or not, and who knows, you know, no one knows how long they're going to live. I know that ultimately where I'm gonna spend eternity because what Christ did for me on the cross, it's not because I'm a good person. It's because he died and paid for my sins. And so I have eternal life and this is not something that can be taken away. I had the certainty assurance for by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So this gift is extended to everyone. And I could tell you that this gift is what powers my life and gave me the courage to face this journey of cancer. Thank you, Jenny, for sharing your story with us. I want to bring us back for a moment to Psalm 23. Psalm 23, starting where we were in verse 5 and reading through the end of the psalm. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The promise that we have as we walk through this life with our Lord is that we will get to dwell in his house forever. That that is where the story goes, that that is how the story ends. And that because of that, we know that we can have incredible hope. I want to bring us back now to the table that Jesus shared, that meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. At one point, he took the bread during the meal and he began to break it and to tear off a piece. And he says, this bread is my body, which is broken for you. And his disciples did not understand what he meant 
But we know that he was looking forward to that next day where his body would, in fact, be broken for us, for the forgiveness of our sins. After dinner, Jesus turns and he picks up a cup. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this whenever you do in remembrance of me. Again, the disciples had no idea what he was talking about, but Jesus was looking forward to that next day when his blood would be spilled out so that we could be cleansed by his blood, so that our sins could be forgiven. And after Jesus tells this, his disciples this, he gives them this promise in Matthew. He says, I will not drink again of this cup until I do it, until I do it with you in my Father's kingdom. It's this promise that, that this meal, which we've come to call the Lord's Supper or communion, it does not just point us back to the cross, though it certainly does that but it also points us forward to the day that Jesus will come back and we will celebrate with him again around a table feasting when all the forces of evil have been defeated and when we are with him to dwell in his house forever. So this evening, we are going to come to the table. We have four tables across the front here with bread and with juice. You can come and you can take a cracker and you can dip it in the juice. And as you do that, let the Lord draw your imagination back to the cross, back to what put Jesus there and to the love that was poured out there, but also let it point you forward. Let it point you forward to the day that he will come back and we will dwell with him in his house forever. There's going to be an usher if you're here in the main rows, in the main section, that will dismiss you by row to come forward to one of the two center tables. If you're sitting in one of the side sections, whenever you're ready, as the music plays, you can stand and come forward and take the elements. Let's pray together as we prepare our hearts. Lord Jesus, what a gift it is to sit in the paradox of the cross, suffering, and salvation, pain, and peace, defeat, and victory, all wrapped up into one. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us. And thank you that you are coming back again and that we will get to spend all of eternity with you in your house. to invite the ushers forward and in the sides whenever you're ready you can come forward
part of our time tonight we just want to create some more space we've walked through our sin we've walked through pain we've talked about hope because of Jesus because of the cross as a prayer team comes you can make your way up here now but we want to create this space uh, that maybe there's something on that rock that you wrote tonight you want prayer for, um, that you would experience freedom in that. Um, may, maybe, maybe there's something that, there's a physical ailment. We want to pray with you. Uh, may, maybe there is an emotional anxiety, battling depression. We want to pray for you and with you. Maybe there's a strain in a relationship with family members or friends. Because of the finished work of the cross, we could have the hope to cry out to our Heavenly Father. And so at any point that I'm talking or we're going to continue to sing, we just want to invite you, our pastors, our prayer team, just want to pray with you and lift those things up before God just to create space to confess those things to name those things to join in to lock arms with our brothers and sisters so we're going to continue to sing just a few more moments we just want to invite you to join us we want to pray with you because of the finished work of the cross, there's hope at the table. There's hope and there's freedom at the table. As we continue to lift up, you're all I want. Say, so you're all I need. You're all I am. You're all I want. Help me know. Help me know you are near. You're all I want. You're 
a few more moments before we, as we dismiss you from this place, but not from God's presence. Um, just want to pray over you. And again, if you want us to just agree with you and pray with you, we'll be here continuing to lift up worship. We just ask that at the moment that you, in, uh, you exit, that you would exit um, quietly until we get outside um, just to honor the space and the presence tonight. So, God, we thank you that we've been able to come together on this night to reflect. God, we thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for your love that you poured out. We thank you, God. We thank you that we can find hope and freedom because of you, because of your sacrifice. God, I pray for my brother and sister as we'll make our way out of this room. Um, maybe there's someone in here, God, that just needs a little encouragement to come together to agree and pray and to lift up those things to you moved by your spirit, God. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. It's in your son Jesus' name we say amen. Amen. So feel free to exit if you would like. If you want to continue to hang out in worship and again if you want prayer, we'll be here with you.
This is my day. 